everybody. My name is Roy Osherov. Uh, I wrote a couple of books on, on unit testing and a book on leadership. Um, and I'm currently writing a book on pipeline-driven organizations. Well, I used to, I guess. You're trying to do something to me? OK. Um, everything you're going to hear now today is based on true, horrible stories from organizations that I was consulting with um, or that I was working for. Um, so it's all based on true sadness. OK? If you want to hear more or read more, you can go to pipelinedriven.org or fivewise.com or just follow me on Twitter and t TikTok. No, not tw TikTok. OK, so our agenda today, we're going to talk about the difference between waterfall pipelines and cooperative pipelines. Co co cooperative pipelines are this thing that I'm calling, and that's kind of the name that I found, and I call it co-ops. I think it's the evolution of where we're going in the world of continuous delivery. Uh, we'll talk about how Netflix kind of moved into that um, pattern without calling it co-ops. Um, we'll talk about what skills we would need to actually succeed in achieving true continuous delivery. So we'll talk about the idea of full cycle developers and probably Q&A we will not have time. So uh, the first thing we'll talk about is cooperative pipelines and how they actually enable true continuous delivery. And I'll differentiate true continuous delivery from continuous delivery or uh, automated builds. Because if I, asked, if I asked everybody here, do you have automated pipelines today in your organization? A lot, does anybody have more than two? More than five? More than 10? <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Not you yourself, your team, but in the organization. Sometimes in large organizations, you can have hundreds of them for different purposes. But are they actually improving? They're actually helping us? So the next question I would usually ask is, do you, if you have automated pipelines, are you doing continuous delivery today? Raise your hand if you are. OK, that's a much smaller percentage than the people who raised their hands earlier. Um, I'll talk about changing the rules, because I think that's where the root cause of our uh, pain is, and why it's actually good for us to go through the pain of transforming how the organization works. OK, true continuous delivery. Uh, to understand true continuous delivery or how to move there, I want to introduce you to a concept, and maybe some of you have known it, but I think it's relatively unknown in the software industry, theory of constraints. Has anybody here ever heard that term? OK, quite a bit. That's good. Um, I got introduced to the theory of constraints from the book The Goal, which I think a lot of people who know the, at least the concept have read that book uh, by Eliao Goldratt. And the theory of constraints is the idea of identifying limiting constraints and continuously reducing them or optimizing them until they're no longer constraints. What is a constraint or a bottleneck? Has anyone here ever uh, had a bottleneck? <laughs> well, most teams today in organizations have bottlenecks. Uh, they could be related to knowledge. For example, only one person knows how to do something. We call that, well, I usually call it a bus factor. A bus factor is how many people have to get hit by a bus for the team to stop working. Bus factor of one is really, really bad. But a lot of teams have a lot of bus factors because of knowledge. But there's also permissions. For example, only some people are allowed to enable something to go through different pipelines or to enable delivery or to sign off on things. So the theory of constraints is kind of a tool that I've adopted in the past few years that has really helped me kind of uh, gel my thought process on continuous delivery and transformation. And I no longer think about it in terms of agility or all that stuff, but I really think about almost everything that I do today in terms of bottlenecks. It's really shaped my, uh, my thought process on that. So the book I'm going to use uh, that I would recommend to read, or at least the audiobook version, is Beyond the Goal. That book really changed how I think about it, how I think about these things. And specifically, he was adapting theory of constraints for a lot of different industries, Eliyahu Goldat. Uh, and specifically for the software industry, he introduced the concept of critical chain. So I recommend that book as well as added bonus reading. OK, so the theory of constraints, one of the powerful tools that we can use is to ask these four questions. And he was talking about the idea that when you introduce a new technology into an organization, you can't just introduce it and expect optimization. 
you have to ask these four questions. What is the power of the technology? In other words, what does it enable us that we couldn't do before? Second is what limitation or restriction or constraint or bottleneck does it actually decrease for us? We'll talk about it. But let's con in the context of a car, can you imagine what constraints we had before we had cars and then cars were introduced? Imagine there were no motorcycles, okay? There was just bicycle everywhere. Okay, so the power of a car is that you can drive very, very long distances, right? What is the restriction or limitation that a car can reduce for us is the length that we can travel. What rules or processes before we had the technology did we have in place because of those limitations? So if I only had a bicycle, one of the rules I probably would have is only find work that is close to my house, right? Because I'm not going to travel uh, four different cities on a bicycle, unless I'm Norwegian, of course. And finally, what rules should we use now instead with the new technology? And this is a very important difference. A lot of organizations, they introduce new technology, for example, pipelines, but they don't change the rules. They keep the old rules based on the old limitations. And so we get a lot of these things. What limitations did we used to have in a world without pipelines, without automated builds? Well, here are some examples of limitations in a world where everything was manual. It took a long time to run tests, right? A lot of times the, the tests themselves were manual. Uh, you only had a specific amount of environments available because you were very, very low on resources, it cost a lot of time and money and effort to raise those environments. I'm sure that doesn't happen today in many organizations, right? Today, everyone has hundreds of environments, right? Um, never mind. Uh, uh, how long does it take to set up an environment was a huge limitation. Uh, who knows how to run the test? Who knows how to load the environments? So there were specific people with knowledge in the organization. How do we know tests have failed? That was a huge limitation. Only the people who ran the test knew that they failed. And how often did we know? When did we get the feedback? The feedback cycles were very, very long. Um, how much information do we have on failures? We don't have log files. We just have maybe screenshots or somebody has to write all that stuff. So we have a limited amount of information. And deployment time can be very, very long. Rollback time can be very, very long. So these are examples of limitations in the world before pipelines. If we combine all that stuff, we can consider it one huge limitation. We do not know at any given moment if we can release the software. In a world that is before pipelines, there was no way to know on demand if we can release the software today. So we had to do everything in our power to try to overcome this limitation or to live based on that limitation. So we created rules, rules that made sense at the time. For example, look, since we don't have all that automation, then you'll only run the test because there are a certain amount of people that can run them, only a specific week or a month, because we have a limited amount of people. We have a limitation. Um, only run the test on one of the branches. We don't have enough people. We don't have uh, enough resources. We don't have enough time to run all the tests in parallel. There's no way that can happen. Uh, we have to use code freezes and create extra branches because of all those limitations, because we don't know what is the status of the so software at any point. Uh, we have to get QA to approve the releases because they're the only ones with information on the status of the test. They're the ones, only ones that actually know kind of what the hell is going on. So of course, we're going to give them the priority of making a decision because they have the most information in the organization. And of course, because they have all this important work, we definitely have to separate them and not do, let them do anything else except continuously, hopefully, run our tests and give us that feedback. They were so, so limited, and the job is so difficult and takes such a long time, we absolutely need to separate them. So we only release when they say that it's OK. And our definition of done, because we have this limitation, will usually be, OK, looks like it's working. Um, but let's not repeat it. For example, in many organizations, one of the rules would be only test the new stuff. We don't have time to test all the old stuff. We assume that the old stuff is okay, and worst case, we'll create a bug item later on. 
And because of all these pieces of knowledge that had to work on different pieces and the lack of knowledge on the entire system, we put different people as gates in the delivery process because we had no information. Developers has, had specific pieces of information. QA had specific pieces of information. Security, compliance, ops. Well, there, were, there was some kind of ops, but th th those days they might have been called integrators, etc. cetera. Um, because it takes such a long time, so we have to batch a lot of stuff together to deliver it together because we cannot spend that type of effort for very, very small things. So let's create a huge bucket of things and then test the whole stuff because it costs so much time, money, and effort. And of course, everyone does exactly what they know how to do. Nobody does nothing that they don't know how to do because we don't have time for that. We're basically in survival mode in this world because everything takes such a long time and it's very risky. And if you have a problem, we're already in a release, just create a bug item, we'll take care of it later on. So those are examples of rules. Of course, in your organization, you might have more rules, different rules, but those rules were built in a world without pipeline, without automation, without a lot of knowledge. But today, we do have pipelines, we do have automated builds, we do have all that stuff. Does that actually help? And that's our core discussion. So here's, as a consultant, when I go to organizations, here's what I see a lot of times. I ask, uh, so do you do continuous delivery? Oh, yeah, yeah, we're de we're, we're, you, you're not going to believe how many pipelines we have. It's crazy. Like, everything is automated. That's cool. Let's look at the pipelines. Well, developers have pipelines, and that pipeline does run on every commit. Where does the pipeline end? Usually in a developer environment. I'm talking about larger organizations, or even mid. Um, but how does it get to QA? A lot of times, QA will even have their own little pipeline. But developers decide, in many organizations, when to merge either between the branches, between dev and test, or to move to different environments. Developers have to sign off on that. QA will have their own automated pipelines. Some of the tests are automated. Some of them will not be automated. But they have their own little pipelines with their own dashboards. And that's cool. But how do they get to delivery? Well, ops people usually take over. They have their own automated pipelines. And of course, before they even can deploy to specific environments like production, sometimes staging, sometimes even earlier, um, the QA gets to decide, the test leads get to decide whether a version is ready. Not the pipeline, but a person looks at the pipeline and says, I think it's good. A lot of times, we need a person to look at the pipeline because the pipelines usually have very large integration tests, and they create a lot of noise, which means that the pipeline is usually red. But the people who know the pipeline really well, I call them the build whisperers, okay? They know the pipeline. You can bring one of them and say, look, is that build really red? And they will go and they will really listen closely to the build, say, uh-huh, yeah, no, that build is green, it just looks red but it's actually good. You're good to go. Okay, so the build whispers are vetoing the build. They make the decision. The build is basically just noisy. At some point, you just look at the screen. It's always red, and you just look to the test, to the people who run that build. What about ops? Ops also get to veto. What about security? Security also gets to veto, and each one of them in many organizations have their own pipelines. But what is between all those pipelines? There's people. And those policies, that's what I'm talking about, that actually prevent us from actually achieving true continuous delivery. Because the pipelines don't actually change our policy. They do not change our process. They're just automating things, but we haven't changed the rules. What do, piper, what do pipelines actually offer us? Because with a pipeline, technically, you can do endless, repeatable tests. You can have endless environments. You just throw a bit more money on it. You can do multitasking at scale and test multiple branches in parallel. You can do full feedback and history for every test that ever happened, ever, in your code, for any branch. OK, so does that mean that we still need these rules when we have pipelines? All th these are the rules from before, right? Um, because usually we have pipelines, but also all these rules. And that's where I think we're going 
wrong. We are still using the old rules and the old policies, but we introduced a new technology. So why does it work for Netflix or Google or Facebook? Why are they able to achieve it, but many other organizations are struggling? Because if we take this pipeline, right, that I just described, and let's flatten it out. Let's just look at it as an organizational pipeline, right? Code goes from one side to the other with a lot of different departments, a lot of different vetoes in the middle. The difference between that and what a Netflix would do or a Facebook would do kind of looks like this. Okay? Do you see it? Okay? That's the difference. Hold on, let me just make sure. You got it? That's the difference. That's the difference. It's always people. I'm always telling everybody that when I do the training, software is never the problem. People are always the problem. Every software problem is a people problem. And here, yet another people problem. If we could just get rid of people in software, everything would be so much easier. Especially in pipelines. Okay, in fact, we could even parallelize that stuff and run it you know, automatically. And then in that pipeline, instead of people watching the gates and approving things, we'll let people create or add tests into the pipeline. So their job will actually change. Instead of saying, this is good, this is not good, their job becomes, I will teach the pipeline to make a decision if this is good or not good. Basically, we are integrating our manual processes as automated tests. And if those tests are passing, then the pipeline should be green. We should not need humans in that equation. And every test can break the pipeline, right? You want security to decide if the pipeline is good enough? Add an automated test. You want ops to decide if the infrastructure is good enough? Add an automated infrastructure test. You want developers, you want testers, you want compliance people, you can even automate compliance checks. Compliance is usually very, very simple. Make sure that some documents are signed somewhere or that they exist in a specific directory. Just make sure you follow the rules. Those things can be automated. So this is in what I call a cooperative pipeline, a co-ops pipeline. Here's how Netflix went through this. Now, I didn't work at Netflix, I didn't consult with Netflix, but I follow them. So everything you see here is from Netflix blog posts, which they published. In 2013, Netflix was where a lot of companies are today. Branch per environment, manual merge, deploy triggers, right? All these things. This should look very familiar to a lot of people. Oh, yeah, we have environments, we have, like, we have to move between them and all that stuff. You had people in the middle of the pipeline. Um, in 2015, a blog post from Netflix discussed the idea of dynamic pipelines, where basically they've automated all of the automation and verification tests up until the moment of deployment to production. Everything else became automated, so no environment movements between different environments had to be done by people, no manual merges. The only time there was a, this is from their own internal tool, the only time where they had a manual judgment was in the production. Go, no, go, manual judgment. Verify cannery scores are correct and you haven't received any emails or something, okay? This is official Netflix uh, documentation. Um, so they were on the way, but production was still uh, far away from that. In 2018, Netflix uh, released a blog post about a new tool that they created that they're using internally called Kayenta. And Kayenta does automated metrics analysis in production or in any environment that you, that you choose. It even has an API. It's, it was built as part of Spinnaker, which is, was another project, but you can technically use it as standalone. And what they wanted to do is to remove the human equation that from the person that looks for emails and, look in the, uh, and looks in the analytics after deployment to production to say, yeah, it looks good, let's deploy the whole thing. So Kayenta looks at the whole thing, looks at averages, uses, uses, uses statistic analysis on the metrics that you provide using Prometheus or a lot of different tools, and basically makes a judgment. It makes a judgment and actually deploys the entire thing. No humans in the equation. This is a no human pipeline. 
So Netflix went from 2013 to 2018, which they wrote about it, and you can assume that if they wrote about it, it was probably used a bit earlier. But it took them a few years as well to even you know, get to that stage as well. This was 2018, this is today's 2022. A lot of organizations are still in the first step where Netflix exists today. Okay, so this was their, uh, these were the first three blog posts. Then another uh, blog post in 2018 that Netflix released was the idea of a full cycle developer. And a full cycle developer, their job is to take part of, in any of these processes, design, development, test, uh, uh, deployment, operation, and support. Right? Developers are not just developers, they're also testers, they're also ops, they're also um, support. Developers are full cycle developers. Because in a system where a pipeline makes all the judgment calls, everybody has to be related to the pipeline, which means that everybody get, needs to write tests that will run in the pipeline, everybody needs to understand how pipelines operate. Everybody needs to understand how tests are formed and how, co how to write code, because nothing is manual in that delivery process. This is kind of scary. A lot of organizations are not in that position today. I call it SDLC 2.0. Um, and, I, I, and I came across this after thinking about the idea of pipeline-driven organizations, and I was looking for examples of organizations that implement it, because you, I knew that they were implementing a variation of it, and I was very happy to find all these kind of public blog posts that talk about it. So instead of saying, look, we want to automate something, so let's call it DevOps. We want to automate the testing, so let's call it Dev Test Ops. We want to aut automate machine learning, AI Ops. Uh, we want to automate, uh, what else did I miss? Uh, there's probably, a, a, I don't know, there, there's a bunch more, right? So. At some point, you're going to get like this uh, test dev AI, blah, 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 ops. And like, okay, what's your role? Well, I'm, I'm that, the cyclops or whatever. So I just call it a pipeline-driven organization because ultimately there's going to be another thing tomorrow that you want to join into the pipeline. So instead of just adding another two, let, two or three letters into that name, we're a pipeline-driven organization. That's really what we're trying to do. And there are many benefits to doing this. If you trust your pipeline, and you have a pipeline that kind of looks like this, or in a variation of this, there are one of the biggest benefits is that when you move from the left to the right, right? So in the world, in the before, a dev would approve something to merge between branches, but in the world after, the pipeline makes a decision whether the merge was successful. Right? In the left, QA would approve a feature or release as deploy ready. On the right, the pipeline decides. I wrote here the words pipeline delegate. Pipeline delegate, that's basically like a UN delegate. It's someone that votes on your behalf. If you want the pipeline to make a decision about something that you care about, add a test. The test is your delegate. All builds break when a test fails, assuming that your organization has breaking builds. Some organizations have builds that are not green, and not red, they're like yellow or something. Don't do that, okay? The whole point of the build is to provide feedback that's actionable. Yellow is not actionable. Yellow is like, I think it works. And what do you need? You need build whisperers again. What are build whisperers? They're the bottlenecks. They're part of the bottleneck. I want to add one extra thing, right? There's a bunch of stuff that happens here. But has anyone here ever worked in the, in, in the role of a test lead or in a test department and they had to approve a release? Even not a tester. Has anyone here ever had to approve a release? Sign off on a release. What a joyful occasion that is, right? <laughs> Sign off on this release that maybe hundreds of people have worked on for two months. Well, of course, I know everything that happens in this code. I will sign off. Well, actually, the last release really had a lot of problems, so sign off that this time there are no problems. Well, of course, let me sign in blood. I literally saw organizations that create a paper and you actually have to sign it for compliance. And how much stress is there to sign that piece of paper? That, well, I think this is one of the reasons people burn out. How can you even ask a person to be accountable for so much code that they've never seen with so little information. We are not supposed to do that in a pipeline-driven organization. In a pipeline-driven organization, we have tests, 
if you want to trust the pipeline, create the test that you want to run. And if the pipeline, if the tests are passed, we're already in production. If the pipeline is read, you don't have to approve or disapprove. I would say that sometimes disapproving a release is even more stressful. Uh, we, are all, we all need this release. Please sign off on this release so we can release it. Well, it's not ready. Come on, dude, we have to release this software. There's so much pressure, it's scary. What do you, you want to put a person in that position with all that pressure, management is like swooping upon them like eagles. Sign the release, sign the release. I would quit at some point. Oh, and we take the money first, then I would quit. So, the biggest thing we can possibly accomplish at the beginning, just by implementing this, is reducing the amount of stress. If the pipeline is red, the pipeline is red. There's nothing I can do about it. The test failed. Of course, the worst thing you can do is to, what, comment out the test, check off the test. Of course, nobody here does that, right? Nobody here has ever disabled a piece of the build. In a pipeline-driven organization, you do not disable pieces of the build. Because the whole point is that if the build is green, you deliver. But the build can be red for a while. But when it's green, ah, oh, you should see when it's green. It's beautiful. OK, so the only question left is, would you let your build deploy to production? And most organizations, if I ask them, they will say, <laughs> I don't even let my people that I trust the most deploy to production. You think I'm going to let the build deploy to production? We have ops people, their whole job is to say no. Their job, they're defined, they're, they're measured by how much they say no. They're measured by uptime. They're measured by how often the software does not change. OK, so that is an example of a policy change. Remember, I talked about changing the rules. We've introduced this beautiful technology, very powerful, but we're keeping the old rules. If we actually want to invest in that, we have to change the rules. And this is what the Netflixes are doing. What did they do? They changed the policies. They changed the rules. And that enabled them to run much faster. But it had to create a different structure in the organization because there was a lot of skill challenge. Remember the uh, full cycle developer we talked about. So here's an example. When I usually come to organizations and we talk about these transformations, and that connects to the previous talk that we had as well. A lot of organizations are fighting with the idea of a pipeline-driven organization, whether they want to admit it or not. They're on that road. Developers have already felt this. If you're a developer, and I'm assuming most of you are developers, you've already been asked to do a lot of stuff that usually you would not have done. For example, being a full stack, going across different layers, uh, understand a bit more about how the pipelines work, maybe write automated tests. I really hope so, right? Uh, Maybe start thinking about security. A lot of organizations are integrating security. It's really good, but it's really, really tough. You have to learn a lot of things. And also coaching. Where is the coaching coming in? Well, developers are not the only ones that have to contribute to a pipeline, right? Ops also have to contribute. Ops also go through this transformation. How, how do I know? Because they, they weren't called ops before. So I know they were going through that transformation. A lot of them just change the name, but they don't change the rules, so everything stays exactly the same. They're just called ops, but their job is still to say no. But in this world, in a pipeline-driven world, they have to learn a lot of things, and some of them have already started. Infrastructure as code, writing automated tests for infrastructure, so learning how to code. A lot of them do, are not developers. Automated testing is really difficult if you've never been a developer, but you want to write infrastructure tests. Uh, integrating pipelines. A lot of them used to do integrations manually and deployment manually. Now we're asking them to automate everything. And of course, coaching. Who would they coach? They would coach, they would coach the developers, right? The developers need to learn how the pipelines work. They usually never needed to do it. Now they do. What about security? Oh, security is slowly today beginning, slowly in the past couple of years, beginning to go through that process. But they're still very much kind of in the old policies. If you're an organization that has security departments today, you know that they represent a very powerful bottleneck in the organization. But in a pipeline-driven organization, you want security in the pipeline. You do not want another handoff. As much as possible, you want to reduce it. 
So security will also need to learn how to play inside the pipeline. A lot of times, security will have their own pipelines. They know about automation. They know how that stuff works. But they're not integrating it into the delivery process. A lot of times, they do not do a lot of coding. They do not write automated tests, but they will automate using some tools. And that's fine. But they will need to learn how to integrate the with the pipeline, and they would need to do coaching. Who would they coach? Well, they need to coach the ops people about environment security, and they need to coach the developers about security and building security in. And of course, I know that if I asked, all of you will tell me that security have always been the most helpful, the most coaching people in your organization today, right? They're easy to find. You, they're right there as you need them. You need something, security is there to tell you yes. Is that correct? Am I, am I missing something? Must be in a parallel universe. Um, and finally, testers. Testers have been feeling the pain for the past five, probably even 10 years. The pain of automation, the pain of learning to code. But testers have been in that road. And we've, we, we had the gut feeling that they should be going through that road. But now we can put it in a name. Oh, we're not doing DevOps. We, we're in a pipeline-driven organization. So we want our testers to also teach the pipeline how to, how to make good decisions. So things that they usually test manually, they will find a way to automate. Some things, yes, will never be automatable because they need human uh, decision making. But a lot of things are. A lot of things are. And there are different notions of that you can have a delivery pipeline that is fully automated, and you can have a discovery pipeline where you can add extra information, for example, performance, monitoring, UX, whatever. But it does not hurt delivery, even if it fails. And you can have a delivery pipeline that has to be green. Just that notion of having these two separate pipelines can be very powerful because you have to find a place for the tests that you either cannot automate or that are very noisy. But either way, testers, they have to learn about automated testing, coding, test infrastructures, because the organization is going to use them, integrating them into the pipeline because they have to contribute to the pipeline. And finally, coaching. Who would they coach? They would coach everybody. Everybody. Because in a pipeline-driven organization, everything is a test. Everything is a test. What is a pipeline? It's one big test. It's either red or green, hopefully. It's either red or green, not yellow, please. It's a big test. And it's made up of smaller tests. And if one of those smaller tests is red, the whole test becomes red. So in a pipeline-driven organization, whoever knows how to write good tests is king and queen. They are the people who have the most experience, I'm not talking about people with less experience, but people, testers with good experience, have been reading books about testing for the past 5, 10, 15, 20 years. They've looked at different scenarios that as a developer I might never even, even thought about. They look at the system from a different perspective than developers. They can teach developers so much, but not only developers, right? They can teach everybody. So this is a very small diagram of the dependencies between the different pieces of knowledge. And I've put a color for each one, because what you can see is that everybody is kind of starting to integrate with everybody in a pipeline-driven organization. And this is where transformation begins to be very, very difficult. Now, if we accomplish this, there are a lot of benefits. First of all, just from a personal perspective, we talked about less stress. From a point of view of job security, in a pipeline-driven organization, everything is test, but also everything has code. Security is integrated everywhere. And ops is part of the whole thing, which means that as you, as you become more and more professional and you, and you become a cross-stack developer, ops, whatever it is, you become more valuable to the organization, either here or the next one. And what I'm trying to say is that the next time that you're going to look for a job, there's going to be people that have those skills and there's going to be people that do not. And the people, the people that have those skills are going to be prioritized because we're moving into that world. Whether we like it or not, I think we're moving into that world. For the organization, it can be a huge benefit. Because we're reducing bottlenecks, we can create faster lead times, faster feedback, uh, less bugs in production, less bus factors, and bottlenecks and basically achieve true continuous delivery, like the CEO always told us. So 
some examples of rules and processes for the new world. The pipeline decides. The pipeline is the judge. If you want juries, create tests. The juries will testify for the judge. And if one of the juries says, ah, actually, I'm not crazy about that stuff, then the judge says, well, no, we all have to agree. Um, second, we need to trust the pipeline to make that happen. And if we don't trust the pipeline, then our job becomes teach the pipeline enough so that you can trust it. Second thing, uh, third thing, we run the pipeline as often as we can, do, we can uh, allow it, or as many pipelines as we can. A simple example. If your pipeline today takes three hours to run, should you run it once a day or once a week? No. You should run it every three hours because the feedback cycles are much, much faster. And every time you optimize the pipeline, your feedback cycle becomes uh, faster and faster. Stop thinking in terms of days and start thinking in terms of feedback loops that are continuous. Would you want to know that your code works only tomorrow? Or do you want to know that it worked in three hours or in one hour or in 15 minutes? Even if you didn't do any other optimization, even if your pipeline sucks in terms of speed, you can still usually run it much, much sooner than you realize. Or, but who decides when to run it? That's a policy. That's a rule. We can change it. Run the test on as many environments as possible. Instead of deciding that you run the pipeline for a specific environment, run it in as many environments as possible. That's what this enables us. We should use this. But usually organizations have policies to only run things in specific environments. And we think that we're just stuck in that type of reality. But the truth is, is that we're there just because of a bunch of decisions earlier that can be changed. We're all learning how to develop software. This is, you can treat it as an experiment of pipeline-driven organizations, and I highly recommend using that word. Let's experiment with the pipeline-driven decision-making. Um, any manual test is potentially uh, entered into a pipeline as automated. So whatever you can, you automate. Of course, there could be huge technical debt, but as a vision, as an ongoing effort, this can be very powerful. Every test that you automate is a test that you stop doing manually, which means that you actually save a lot of time. The more you re have to repeat the test, the more time that you save. Economies of scale. So you actually create a very positive feedback loop whenever you automate even a single manual test, because now you actually have free time that you would never have had. Because your free time, what do you do with that free time? You automate another test. Now you have even more free time. Well, we can automate another one with that extra free time. Et cetera, et cetera. It's a very positive feedback loop. But to do that, you need to change the policies and the rules in many organizations. If the pipeline is green in all stages, we are already in production. Right? Some organizations do not go to production. Right? You have different customers with different whatever. But as close to production as possible. Um, everyone writes tests. Everyone is a tester in a pipeline-driven organization. Uh, work in small batches. Instead of working in huge batches, reduce the amount of batches. Get the pipeline to run on very small increments. If the pipeline is green, that small increment is delivered. Of course, that means you will have to learn how to use stuff like feature toggles, etc., because you don't need code freezes anymore, because you get continuous feedback. But feature toggles become your friends, and that is a very important skill. But also, feature toggles require policy change. The first time I had to coach a, a, a team in switching from uh, multiple branches to trunk-based development with, with feature toggles, they were so scared. It takes a leap of faith, and it takes a manager that says, OK, I'm willing to experiment. It is a people problem. It is not a technical problem. Spend 50% of your time teaching the pipeline to make a good decision. Think of yourself as a gardener. You spend most of your time teaching the pipeline to make good decisions. And Last two, you spend time coaching. What the hell? That's a, uh, OK. OK, spend time coaching others about your expertise. That's communication. Is, is there a fire? What the hell? Is the pipeline broken? OK, last one, I promise. Come on. We can do this. Don't disable a part of the pipeline to pass the build. I'm talking to you, and I'm talking to you. And finally, 
A red pipeline means no task, the task is not done. No need to create a bug item. You keep fixing it until it's green and you develop it and then you deploy it. And with that, I want to leave you with one fi Well, I'm just going to jump in because we're out of time. Okay, finally, cooperative pipelines are the thing that I think enables true continuous delivery. We have to adopt new rules instead of the old rules. And it's in our best interest to learn those patterns. If you want to learn more, you can go to pipelinedriven.org, my site, or my Twitter. Thank you very much, everybody. May the force be with you.